right, hello everyone and welcome. As Jim said, my name is Jamila. I'm Linus. And I'm Hayden. And so we're the Homeschool Symbiosis team. Um, and today we're going to be telling you all about the oceans, where they came from, and how they affect climate change. So a well-known ocean scientist once said, the ocean, because of its vastness, can hold secrets for a very long time. That quote is from Paul Snellgrove of Memorial University. The oceans are vast. They cover more than 70% of the surface of our planet. 97% of the Earth's water is in the oceans. The oceans strongly affect climate and weather patterns. They produce half of the oxygen we breathe and absorb carbon dioxide. And although we know a lot about them, there is even more that we don't know. In fact, 95% of the Earth's oceans remain unexplored. And uh, one of the ocean's greatest mysteries is where did it come from? So where did the oceans come from? Well, one theory is geological. Uh, it supposes that water vapor from volcanic eruptions rose into the atmosphere and condensed into clouds. After the Earth had sufficiently cooled, the moisture in the clouds precipitated, slowly filling the Earth's oceanic basins. But there's another theory that is in conflict with that one because that is impossible because those Big clouds would have been blown away by solar wind. The atmosphere had not been stuck to the Earth at that time because there was no magnetosphere. So I can. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. It is? Hold it closer. Okay. So um, all of these big clouds would have. Uh, been swept away by solar wind because the magnetosphere was not holding the atmosphere together. So I instead propose that comets from the Oort cloud beyond Neptune crashed into the Earth and filled the oceans that way. However, that was a theory that came that Carl Sagan proposed before there were any conclusive um, testing of these um, comets. <clears throat> and once they got some samples, it turned out that they had a much higher concentration of this heavy water than is found in our oceans. And what a more likely theory is, is that the water came from these asteroids, um, from the asteroid belts between Mars and Jupiter. And would they, have heavy, they have heavy water concentrations in much lower amounts, which is much closer to our oceans. Besides the fact that the asteroids are much closer to our Earth and more likely to be able to hit us and fill up the oceans with the water that we need. So basically, there are three theories. We ha do not have any idea which one is correct, but we are interested in finding out which one will be due for through further testing. So we don't know where the oceans came from, but one thing we do know um, and can be certain of is Halley's Comet, um, which flies by the Earth every 76 years. Uh, the comet has been coming for a millennia, but it was first brought to the attention of the world by Edmund Halley, uh, who saw it pass on September 15, 1682. And Edmund Halley was an English astronomer, geophysicist, mathematician, meteorologist, and physicist. Although he never lived to see the day, Halley correctly predicted the return of the comet 76 years later in 1758. This is the same year the British Museum first opened its doors. The next time the comet returned, the year was 1835, and Charles Darwin was sailing the seas on the HMS Beagle. 76 years later, in 1910, when Halley's Comet again appeared in the sky, women had just won the right to vote in five US states. Halley's Comet was seen most recently in 1986, the year both the Space Shuttle Challenger and the nuclear reactor in Chernobyl exploded. So the question is, where will our planet be when Halley's Comet returns in 2061? Now that you bring up the topic of nuclear explosions, um, the nuclear testing done by the US in the Bikini Islands was very destructive to the marine environment. Um, the US gathered together what would have been the sixth largest military fleet in existence had it been active for these testings. Um, the very first of these testings was Operation Crossroads, um, which were the first nuclear testings since World War II over here and over here. 
Um, and the uh, follow-up test was codenamed Castle Bravo. And this was the first hydrogen bomb ever made and remains the most powerful bomb ever detonated by the US, as well as the release of the most significant radioactive contamination uh, ever created by the US. So over here, this yellow box is the initial um, area expected to be affected by the bomb. Unfortunately, it turned out to be much larger area, this whole yellow circle here. And um, due to the um, fallout, ex explosion of fallout being over double what was expected, native islanders um, living in these islands and nearby fishermen suffered radiation sickness and it became an international incident due to widespread nuclear contamination. As you can see, all these red areas were uh, nuclear contamination carried away from this initial explosion. Um, if this is the man effect on mankind, imagine the devastation to the marine environment, especially on the delicate coral serening surrounding Bikini Atoll. So uh, radiation is not the only thing, threat that faces corals and other shellfish. Another one, as you may know, is this molecule right here, carbon dioxide. So um, the, as throughout the years, the amount of carbon dioxide that humans produce has been going up, as many of you know, um, and especially over the past um, 1,000 to 200 years. So the oceans absorb 25 to 30 percent of the carbon dioxide that we produce, and this um, can have a negative impact on the chemistry of the ocean and through that, the animals that live in it. So um, corals and crabs and mussels and the other shellfish build their shells out of calcium carbonate. Um, so they are all affected when the ocean has less calcium carbonate in it. Um, so unfortunately, that is exactly what is happening. Um, when CO2 right here is taken in by the ocean, it mixes with seawater to create carbonic acid, which raises um, the acidity and lowers the pH of the oceans. Um, this carbonic acid is a very unstable molecule, so it breaks up into bicar a bicarbonate ion and an H plus ion. Um, this H plus ion goes around the ocean looking for more calcium, more carbonate to bind to, and that creates more bicarbonate, which um, shellfish can't use to build their shells. So there is less bicarbonate in the ocean for the shellfish to build their shells out of. So here's just another example of that. Uh, water forms carbon and carbon dioxide form carbonic acid, um, which creates more bicarbonate ions. And so an interesting thing that I learned is that um, the acidification of the oceans has more of an effect on the baby animals. So you can see here, this is a, a baby clam who's that has been um, um, living in an environment that's conducive to its survival. But this one has been living in a very acidic environment, which you can see it changes the shell composition. And the reason for that is because the baby animals build their shells out of aragonite, which is more easily dissolved by the, CO by the acidity of the oceans. And the adult ones build their shells out of calcite which is harder to dissolve, and both harder to build and harder to dissolve. So there's a um, direct correlation whoop, between the um, amount of carbon in the atmosphere and the decrease in pH of the oceans. So if we lower the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere, we can bring the pH and the co concentration of calcium carbonate back up to where these animals can build strong shells. Yes, and a good way we can reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere is by changing the way agriculture is done today. Um, so this is a CAFO, a concentrated animal feeding operation. And besides a wealth of animal rights and welfare issues, these are very detrimental to our oceans and to our land because they need to be fed immense amounts of food. And each one of these cows gives off an immense amount of waste, as we can see on the next slide. Um, so approximately 900 million tons of manure are produced from CAFOs annually, and that's about three tons of manure for each American. So imagine if each American had to have three tons of manure stored in their apartments or in their yards, or just walking around with it, it would just get completely out of hand. But that's the way <laughs> it actually is, but it's hidden in our waterways. It runs off into streams, lakes, rivers, and eventually winds up in places like Chesapeake Bay. 
um, which have uh, gotten completely unoxygenated because all of this nitrogen and phosphorus found in the waste of the animals um, feeds all the algae in the waters whose population then explodes. Then the algae who feed bacteria uh, cause bacteria populations to explode and bacteria breathe in oxygen and so they create these vast oxygen depleted zones in places like Chesapeake Bay. So this is all, no, virtually no life is living in this big red stripe here where it used to be a beautiful jungle. This is all due to animal and plant agriculture. So speaking of plant agriculture, um, fertilizers and pesticides are also a big um, runoff from all this sort of land here. This is a satellite image of Kentucky. Um, let me find my key card. So pesticides and fertilizers do the exact same thing as manure, essentially. Um, they cause gentrification, and a third of um, corn grown in the United States goes to feed animals. Another third of corn goes to make ethanol, which is a biofuel, which actually takes more oil to produce than it um, gives us energy for. So it's an inefficient transaction now that could change in the future if farming was done more sustainably. But, um, and another tenth of corn goes to high fructose corn syrup, which is essentially bad for you. So 76% of corn grown in the United States is for these three things. So this is, a lot of this is because of government subsidies. The government subsidies are making it so much easier for farmers to make a profit off of corn rather than a more diversified crop. Um, so another reason to uh, maybe look at animal agriculture is because we could feed 800 million more people with the amount of food that we currently feed to animals. This is because when you eat an animal, um, you're eating every single thing that the animal essentially ate. You're consuming all of those resources. And so it's much more efficient to go straight to the plants rather than eat the animals and consume their products first. Um, so hopefully by 2061, we will have reduced our intake of animal products and made a lot more space for forests and fewer desertification zones. So you might wonder how fish play a role in all of this, if they're living in the oceans. Uh, this is a menhaden fish, they're a forage fish. What they used to do is migrate all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to the Gulf of Maine, and they did this every year. This is an old fishing map from the 1800s. But now they've been so overfished that they barely make it up to Chesapeake Bay, which is right in the middle of this map. Um, and even in Chesapeake Bay, they're being fished out of the very waters that they play a key role in restoring because they are the ones who can eat all this algae that's causing these oxygen depleted zones. Um, and the, men the reason why the menhaden are being fished out is because they're being fed to the chickens and the pigs who are producing the waste that is then going to pollute the estuaries. So um, it's a huge cycle. Everything plays into everything else. But if we can reduce our consumption of animals and animal products as a society, maybe eliminate them beyond 2061, it's, it's radical, but I think it could be done beyond 2061, um, then we would have so much more biodiversity in the oceans and on the land. As this pig says, the oceans are filled with opportunities. Um, so, yeah, my main takeaway is that um, if we as a, as a society, as a country, reduce our consumption of animal products, then we will be also reducing our consumption of plants, land use, resources, restoring dead zones, and restoring forests, and making for a healthier ecosystem. Now, sadly, it is harder to create a healthy ocean when it's filled with um, trash and debris the size of Texas and growing larger. This great Pacific vortex, or garbage patch as it's sometimes called, mostly consists of plastics, chemical sludge, and other debris. Midway Atoll alone receives 20 tons of this debris every year around here, and <clears throat> one third of all of the albatross, of the, so one million albatross live on these islands alone, and they all have plastic in their system. One third of all their chicks die from plastic, plastic being fed, fed them, and of the 20 tons that washes up on the island, five tons are fed to albatross chicks. 
effects of these toxic materials goes up the food chain, reaching even us. Cleaning this massive garbage heap will take a great deal of work, but I believe it can be done with our collective help. So these are, this is the insides of some of these animals. The, and these are like the garbage patch. It's just full of all of this debris and trash. And here are just like piles and piles of tires just dumped here. But one of these amazing things is that um, recently a national monument was created around the Hawaiian Islands. Um, it's called Papahanao Makuakea. Uh, it was just uh, signed in as a national monument in 2016 by President Obama, and it's two times the size of the Pacific Trash Vortex, which is incredible. Um, you can, here you can see they're, they're signing it into um, existence. However, however, there are um, still some issues with the uh, fishing practices around these areas. Um, these long lines um, are a much better option than trawling, but unfortunately, um, practices have been very poor and these nets have been allowed to be just dropped to the bottom, choking the corals and other plant life that are there and causing immeasurable damage. Um, here we have volunteers helping cleaning up these messes, but it Unless we change the morals of these, the fishing industry, um, this is going to continue, unfortunately. These are some green sea turtles living in Papahanaumakuakea. They're enjoying their time there. They have a place to go. That's why it's such an important national monument. Here are some gannets and albatross. They're also having a great time at Papahanaumakuakea. So, um, in conclusion, we'd like to introduce you to a group of inspiring scientists who have informed our learning. Uh, there is physicist Richard Feynman, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, marine biologist Rachel Carson, evolutionary theorist Lynn Margulis, and astronomer Carl Sagan. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do before 2061. Um, before Halley's Comet returns, and we would like to share our uh, collective visions with you. My vision is for us to reduce our animal product consumption as a society and become more kind to animals and the ecosystems around us. Uh, my vision is that the Pacific Ocean can become a clean place full of diversity and animal life. My vision is a reduction in the CO2 levels of our world. And my vision is a world on which all species are valued equally and where human beings are just one of the many inhabitants of this planet. Yes. <laughs> so in the words of Carl Sagan, Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. Every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every <laughs> superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. One thing. So. And you, we, we need to set up the other computer. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Right now.